This is In the Trenches, Broadcast 51. Welcome to In the Trenches, where entrepreneurs, artists, writers, designers, inventors, warriors, and leaders share their stories of doing the hard, creative work that impacts all of our lives. Let the journey inspire you to do something worthwhile, build something bold, and create your life's work. And now, your host, Tom Morgus. Welcome back, everyone, to another broadcast of In the Trenches. Today's guest is Gary Auerbach, who is, get this, the 1995 World Freestyle Frisbee Champion. So Gary, I'm so excited to have you on the show today to talk about that, how you did that, and what you're doing now um, in the Frisbee world. So Gary, thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me on. This is great. Did I get that right? It's it's Frisbee Freestyle World Champion, correct? Yeah, it can be Frisbee Freestyle or Freestyle Frisbee, either way. Okay, just checking. So tell us a little bit about yourself and and obviously that's going to come up, so I want to hear about that. So yeah, just take mm-hmm. us take us back to to being a champion at, at frisbee. Well, well, it was uh, pretty exciting. So you know, it's going back a little ways now. But in 1995, I was um, went and competed in the freestyle championships. It was called the Freestyle Players Association World Championships in Jacksonville, Florida. And um, that year, actually, I hadn't competed in 10 years. So I in 1985. My last competition was winning the Canadian championships. And then I kind of hung up my Frisbee, so to speak. I used to hang them up on my walls, um, you know, with a nail on the wall. That's how I decorated uh, my apartments and stuff. But in between 1985 and 1995, I didn't compete in freestyle. So when I went and uh, pulled out my old school moves with um, a partner who also was, you know, into doing things like from old school or back in the old, old tricks, we just kind of surprised the judges and we had a little twist because we played with two Frisbees the whole time. And you can see all this and, you know, there's a YouTube video of our world championship routine and that's, uh, you know, what happened then. So how'd you get into, to Frisbee? Well, actually I, I started playing when I was about uh, 11 years old at summer camp. I learned how to throw different ways. And then coming home from camp, I was better than any of my friends at throwing a Frisbee. So while other, you know, kids were, you know, throwing a football or, or, or playing hockey, I, I grew up in Toronto, actually. So there was a lot of that. Um, you know, I was trying to get them to play a little more Frisbee so that I could you know, show off my skills because I had, you know, a forehand and an overhand wrist flip and a thumber and all these different cool Frisbee throws. And then it was a friend of my father's who could do some Frisbee tricks. And he was kind of like, to me, a a role model. He was a counselor for a a summer camp program that my dad ran. And I think he and his girlfriend also used to babysit for me sometimes. So whenever Randy would come over, you know, he'd have a new trick to show me and I'd always try to keep up with him. And I got better than him. And then he tried to keep up with me for a little while. And then I kept getting better. And I I started, you know, competing with, uh, you know, some of the best first in Canada and then, you know, the best in the world. So where was the world championship held? Well, the year I won uh, Jacksonville, Florida. Um, And the funny thing is, you know, that tournament that year, Um, The weather turned bad and we had to go indoors into a gymnasium. Now, if you think about it, a couple guys from Canada actually benefited from going into the gym. You know, we love to play outdoors also, but the win game is a little bit different than the no win game. And we had the advantage because we'd spent many more hours playing indoors. And our routine was really uh, choreographed. Um, I didn't mention that those years in between 85 and 95, um, I I pursued and achieved and, you know, succeeded at being a professional ballet dancer. I actually started dancing at 17 to improve my Frisbee game. And in those years that I I wasn't competing, I danced in Germany and South America and and, uh, here in the United States and in the Hartford Ballet. And. I just had a sense of choreography. So our routine had a little more choreography than 
you know, I should say any of the other teams and not having the wind blowing the Frisbee actually did assist us. So how many people were on the team? Oh, so a freestyle routine is uh, two people in pairs, obviously. And then there's another division in competitions of uh, three three people called co-op. And we competed with uh, somebody from New York in co-op, but we didn't advance to the, you know, semifinals. Um, but our our pairs routine really put us at the top of our pool, which meant when everybody went to the finals, I think there were nine teams that year in the finals or usually eight. Um, we got to play last, which is, I believe, still always a benefit because what sticks in the judges' minds is, of course, the last thing that they see. And, you know, they kind of acknowledge that you're seated the top, you know, team. So we did get to play last and, you know, felt that that was an honor, too. And we we really nailed the routine. Again, you know, it's, it's fun to watch and share with people. Um, but that is up on YouTube. Very cool. So, you know, tell me a little bit more in terms of like, what do you do after you win the world championship? <laughs> That's what I asked everybody. I said, so now what happens? You know, I was I was thinking maybe I'd get a call from, you know, Nike or Adidas or uh, Puma, you know, and become part of a, a, a promotional team. Um, the year that we won the, uh, the Toronto Raptors were just coming out or, you know, that was their first year. So we were trying to line up some, some halftime shows, that type of thing. I mean, it's a great form of entertainment and you can make it more entertaining, um, you know, by just using some theatrics and, and crowd involvement and, and trick throws and stuff like that, which is popular now, actually. Um, but what I kind of looked at was, well, what could I do with this title? And I, I kind of say I had nothing to fall back on. So I fell forward and my whole focus was trying to um, promote to other young people or to young people that there could be, you know, a, a, something that they could pursue. And whether it was for for fitness or fun or friends, you know, is just a, a great way to um, to be active and. Now, I also was playing a lot of ultimate Frisbee and competing in world championships in ultimate Frisbee, which is the team game. Um, so my first inclination was, well, I'm going to go into the schools and teach kids about ultimate Frisbee and some tricks and things like that. And then the teachers started asking me if I could teach the teachers, you know, at their professional development days. So I started a, a little business. Um, going around and, and to different different phys ed teacher conferences all over, you know, Ontario and the United States. Um, and I'd, I'd go down to conferences in Florida and visit my grandparents. And so I, I kept sharing the idea that there's simple things that you can show the kids and make them lifelong Frisbee players. Very cool. So tell me a little bit about, because that's, I mean, that's got to be a struggle, though. You said, you know, fall forward. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not just like... That simple, is it? Or was it? No, no, it, 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 it wasn't that simple, of course. So I, like when I say I fell forward, I, I took it upon myself. I was became a full time promoter of myself and I, you know, introduced myself to the, the principals. If I saw a new school that I'd never been to, I'd I'd introduce myself. And I felt like that I had a like a, a, a ticket, just the, the title of being a world champion you know, and that I could talk to the kids about what it takes to become a world champion, whether that's, you know, in Frisbee or, or skating or something else. You know, I knew that it took a lot of discipline and exercise. And, and I also knew that, you know, to become the best, I was willing to go do something as extreme um, as ballet classes, you know, and that sometimes that's what people need to do to make them stand out and distinguish them from the other competitors. If you're at liberty to talk or tell us this, I'm, I'm curious mm -hmm. about this. How much does a world Frisbee champion make from the championship? Oh, well, that was the most embarrassing thing ever. <laughs> um, because when I, when, when, I, when I looked at the, at the check that they gave us, I thought, well, shouldn't there be another zero on there? Um, I think the payout was less than $100. Um, I have to say that's like, such a rinky dink payday. Do you know what I'm saying? 
And we also got a pair of sunglasses and I think a volleyball and a trophy, which is somewhere, you know, is a, a, a ceramic looking Frisbee trophy. It says first place on it. But other than that, I mean, that was not what my my winnings. Um, truthfully, mm-hmm. you know, my winnings has been uh, almost 20 years now and uh, tens, if not 100,000 kids that I've seen or had the opportunity to throw a frisbee to or tell them stories about where the frisbee comes from or, you know, share, you know, my passion with them is, you know, has been my payday. And I guess in that way, it yeah. still goes on, you know? <laughs> sure. No, no, no. I, I know. And that's why I'm kind of curious. So, I mean, that happens yeah. and it's like how, so if, if, if that's the payday, right? Well, and I, and I, yeah. I recognize in the broader scheme of things, why that's not, and I'm not mm-hmm. bringing that up because that's like, that's the focal point. I'm bringing that up, yep. but to, to, for this next question, which is, you know, w- did people think you were crazy to then lean into this as something that you want to do full time or in some capacity, something similar or, or just lean into the area of Frisbee when there's essentially no money in it? Right. Right. Well, like I, um, you're right. I still believe there's there's no money in com- competition in freestyle Frisbee. You know, that that's not the case for disc golf, um, however. Um, but when, what, what I was leaning into was not, um, freestyle competition. I only went, I I guess I went to three, maybe four other world championships since then. But what I did discover was that there was a real market and an opportunity to, to speak to kids. Um, it became my focus. And also I did some corporate, um, disc golf events where again, just as a Frisbee pro, I was the expert who could, you know, help them become more comfortable with the equipment. And then they had more fun on the, on the Frisbee golf course. Um, so what, what, what I set up was, you know, a program where I was, um, definitely an expert at, you know, learn showing other people how to do tricks. And I always focus on my performance, showing people what they can do and not so much what I can do. I flatter myself, I guess, by saying that the kids call me Tony Hawk, but with a Frisbee, you know, and, but I'd really like to meet Tony Hawk, you know, and, and, and see if there's a a way to work with him and try to teach him some Frisbee tricks. Yeah, that's interesting. So tell me about that first year then. Was this your full-time job trying to, to do this, to be somebody who, and was, and, and was the idea primarily like, let's go to schools or you kind of said about going to to yeah. shows, I think. Right. So tell us a little bit about that process and, and, and the evolution of that. Right. Right. That, that's a good point. I mean, I, I am remembering back. That was not my intention um, was visiting schools. Um, I really thought we had an opportunity to uh, work with some professional sports teams um, set up to do things like in commercials, even because Ultimate Frisbee was was becoming huge in Toronto. The Ultimate uh, Toronto Ultimate League w- w- was a huge force. And I thought, you know, that we might connect with some marketing directors who wanted to put us in in on TV, you know. So I was looking for that kind of payday, uh, you know, to be honest. And it, while I was doing that, the opportunities came up that I knew teachers. I, uh, my father was a, a fourth, fifth grade teacher. So I started to visit his school that principal told another principal I'd start getting calls. And and I quickly realized that I, I wasn't charging enough money for my program and that I was starting to get good at it. And so I kept raising my prices, you know, and, you know, I was p- pretty comfortable with that for a while. How long was that transition then? Um, you know, probably the first year um, I, I was – focusing more on, on, on trying to get bigger projects, um, and smaller projects. I should, you know, smaller like school programs were, were coming in. We also got on TV, uh, a lot, like I think at probably 10 or 15, you know, uh, talk shows and news shows. And th- this was something that I was just really comfortable with. Um, my freestyle partner at the time kind of backed down from that and, you know, said, no, you go do it, Gary. And, you know, I'm fine just, you know, not being the the, the public of side of it. 
Um, but I, I really enjoyed it. And I was always able to make the reporters smile and make them look good. So it was a nice story. And then I would share that with other people. And I'd invite the new news crews and the, the new newspapers out to my school performances. And they were always good photo ops. Yeah. So, and this is, this, so you started, was it, and, and is it still primarily or entirely schools or do you also do other events as well now? And, and, or how, how does that work? Yeah. Well, some of the other um, things that I've kind of branched into over the years is, you know, I was playing with one Frisbee and then with two Frisbees, I wanted to juggle Frisbees. So I learned how to juggle. Um, I became a pretty proficient juggler and uh, started going to juggling conferences and festivals, also teaching Frisbee skills to jugglers. But then I started doing a, a juggling program, um, again, teaching people how to juggle. So I've done that at, at schools and summer camps and for meetings, uh, you know, little breaks at conferences or special events and picnics. And I'm invited sometimes, you know, to perform um, you know, at different festivals um, or team building events uh, for the local university. I've worked a little bit, uh, you know, when they're starting off with new staff. So been changing into that a little bit. And I'm also looking at the opportunities that I might have um, speaking to people again about, you know, that lifelong skills and passions. What goes into to selling that service, especially in the beginning? when you're pretty fresh to it, into approaching events or approaching schools and selling your service? How does, how do you do that? Well, um, I'm an expert at it and that I've been able to do it, but I, I, I'm not the expert at it because I, I still am trying to improve. I think it's always changing, um, really knowing what the school is looking for. Um, even now, or in the last couple of years, there's been such a focus on anti-bullying. Um, I've been able to to address that um, and speaking more about, well, you know, when people find a way to play together, um, they're going to not be in a position of bullying or they're not going to be against each other. They're going to be with each other or on the same team. Um, a lot a lot of people look at it differently um, and have had success or you know, as much or or more than me. And I'm still, you know, trying to find that, that way to tap into, to different things that are still true to me, you know, true to my belief, again, with, uh, you know, putting something as simple as a plastic circle in people's hands, I can empower children. And um, that that's really an amazing thing that I'm, I'm sticking with. Um, and the juggling is like that also actually. Yeah. But you know, I'm, 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 I'm particularly curious about this because I, sure it's, it's specifically speaking, like I, I approach, I have this, I, I have this maybe service or skill or something like that. And uh-huh. I'm like, okay, I want to, how about schools? So what do I do? What I, I mean, how do I approach the school? How do you talk to them? How do you break into that? Especially if it's like, I don't know, like a public school or something like that, where you know, who do you speak to? How do you present it? What do you charge? And how does that, how does that process work? Sure. Um, so I've, I've had success by, by, uh, by walking right into a school and, and, and asking to speak to the principal or phys ed teacher. I've also attended as a vendor, as an exhibitor, um, principal conferences, PTA conferences, Um, teacher conferences. And what I'm offering is that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a live role model that the kids really do need to see that role model. You know, what they see on, on, on TV and and actors and movies and stuff is great, but then there might be a time when some story changes and it's not so great, but I'm willing to come in and, and, and be a role model for, for the kids and talk to them about a number of issues so approaching the school, I mean, it was great to have a brochure when I had when I started. It was like, you know, websites were really new, you know, but having a web presence is is great now. Um, having videos and, ex, you know, sharing who you are. Um, I haven't had this problem, but of course, you know, you can't go to a school with cigarettes or smelling of cigarettes, you know. Um, there's just, you have to have a, a pretty clean image, uh, to be a, a performer like that. Yeah. And how about for, for say professional events? Um, how was that different or, you know, easier, harder? And, and what was that like? 
Yeah, well, getting the professional events sometimes it's um, it, it's an agency that uh, that sees me at at us at an, at one event and then they kind of represent me. So they'll contact me and say, "Oh, we have this company picnic or this big street festival, and will you come in? And how much do you charge for a couple hours?" You know, and it's it, it's always interesting because you want to get you know, the most money you can get, but you don't also want to overprice yourself, you know, so there's a fine line. And sometimes you can be honest with an, an agent and say, well, can your client afford this? Um, and then you have to decide, well, is it worth the added time of traveling and things like that? You know, but it is different than the schools. Interesting. So how do you balance it all then? Because um, I assume there's a lot of travel involved. Um, there is a lot of travel. I mean, it's nice when you can book a couple of gigs, uh, you know, and do one road trip. Like, say, if I'm going away overnight, I'll try to set up two or three um, gigs at the same time. Um, but what I also look for are just those networking opportunities, actually, um, by either tapping into a Chamber of Commerce event in another city, or I'm a, a, a member of a Kiwanis club here in Winchester. So, Sometimes now when I travel, I'll attend a Kiwanis meeting, which is a service club that focuses on um, doing great things for kids in the area and for the world. So I'll be able to do, you know, a job at a school and I'll be able to visit, you know, a local chamber or a Kiwanis meeting and tell them what I'm doing in their community, which is great networking for me. But I also might be planting seeds for future work there. Interesting. So have you used online marketing at all or, or built, I mean, I know you have a website, but have you, has that been a lead generator for you? Um, I need it to improve on that. And, um, so in the years, a few years ago, I, I was doing some Google, Google ads, uh, just in a certain area. I was able to, you know, um, hone into, you know, a geographical area. Um, I couldn't tell if it was working or not. So I wasn't, I guess I wasn't doing it right. Um, I know people have a lot of success with that and I'm still looking at ways to improve my marketing, you know, to be honest with you. So really then everything you've done to, to build your platform has been, I guess, direct, direct, I don't know what you would call that. Cold, cold calling, <laughs> direct, I mean, well, direct sales, it, like how do you, you know, networking obviously. Yeah, networking, um, having, uh, I've printed tens of thousands of business cards. Um, being a world champion, I offer to autograph them for kids. You know, um, I'm really free with those. So i handing those out, um, letting people, you know, find my website and trying to do that. I've been a guest on, on, on a number of um, podcasts now and, and also have been written about by people who want to write stories about people who are finding a way to make a living through play and following their passions. So those are kind of great things, um, you know, for my audience to, or for, for, for new people to learn about me, to become aware of me. Very cool. Well, we're coming up on time here. Where can people reach out to connect with you? Where can they find you? Um, tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Well, it's uh, real simple, frisbeeguy.com or uh, Gary at frisbeeguy.com. I'm right there. Um, if, you, if you type in my name and Frisbee on YouTube, you get all sorts of videos. And like I said, I, when I was on TV a whole bunch, they're, they're all up there now. Um, some of them are pretty funny. And I'm on Facebook also. Um, my, my full uh, title of my business at first was Spinning Bees Professional Frisbee Clinics. Then I moved that into Spinning Bees Frisbee Guy, and um, that's a long story. But you know, the name that you choose sometimes sticks with you for <laughs> longer than you want. But now I'm, I'm the Frisbee Guy, and I'm I'm loving that. And uh, you know, I'm not fr the Frisbee King. I didn't win the World Championships this year, and I don't expect to next year. Uh, I don't really do much in the competition field anymore. But um, I love playing with people at all levels whether they're beginners at disc golf or helping them become a better ultimate Frisbee team or showing people some really cool tricks, you know, that they might pick up on. Awesome, Gary. Well, I really appreciate having you on the show. It's good insight into, um, you know, quite the niche in terms of if somebody out there is listening to this and 
has something that doesn't fall within maybe a more traditional category, how you could go about actually building a legitimate personal brand and business out of it. I really, at the end of the day, I think that's what you've done, Gary. Um, and so thank you so much for sharing that story. Yeah. Thank, thank you. This is a great show and thanks for uh, all the work that you, you do for in the trenches for the entrepreneurs and everybody else. Thanks so much, Gary. And we'll be in touch. Okay. Take care. And that wraps up another broadcast of in the trenches. If you're interested in checking out the show notes, just head over to tomworkers.com slash podcast to see our latest episodes. Also, I just wanted to give a quick update to fans and listeners of In the Trenches and specifically what I'm working on right now. For the past two years, I've been publishing books, my own and others, through Insurgent Publishing, my boutique publishing company. In the past six months alone, I've helped four individual authors launch their books to bestseller on Amazon, including Dan Norris's The Seven Day Startup and David Nihil's Do You Talk Funny, among others. And both of those books are still top of the charts months after launch. I've learned two important things from all this. Number one, that people still read books. And believe it or not, they're willing to pay for the good ones. And number two, the $60 billion book industry is only getting bigger and the barrier to entry is only getting lower. Which means access to this market has never been closer to the average writer, blogger, or author. It is literally within the grasp of anyone who wants it. But you need to know how to approach it the right way. With patience, with a strategy, and with the right implementation and execution. That's why I've been able to launch so many bestsellers, many that are still top of the charts, because we brought great books to the people who wanted and would pay for them. No slimy sales tactics, just honest, powerful marketing. Now, I want to show other authors and publishers how to do the same. Four months ago, I launched the pre-beta to a new super secret platform called Publishers Empire. In that time, I've helped a dozen authors and publishers start to bring their ideas to life. And with their help and feedback, we've quickly developed what is, in my opinion, the best, most comprehensive publishing training platform in the world. And now I'm getting ready to open the doors up to a few more students. So if you're interested in being part of a tight-knit family of publishers who help and support one another through their writing and publishing projects, if you want access to over 100 HD training videos to take you through the writing and publishing process, if you want access to proven copy and paste book marketing and sales copy, stuff that we've used to launch bestsellers. And if you'd like professional book covers and templates, you could plug your own work into and look like a pro in minutes. And if you'd like all of that while getting the chance to be mentored by me, check out publishersempire.com and sign up to be notified when we launch. That's www.publishersempire.com. I hope to see you there. As always, this is Tom Morcus. If you're listening to this, You are the resistance. Thank you for listening to In the Trenches. Your creative work doesn't stop here. Join the resistance, the small but growing army of entrepreneurs and artists putting a dent in the world at www.tommorkis.com. Never fight alone. Join the resistance.